Hi. I've never seen this happen before. Good morning. The Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting of March 9th, 2023 is called to order. I remind everyone to please silence all electronic devices. Please note that the meeting is broadcast and the video of the meeting will be available after the meeting is concluded on the county's website. At this time, I would ask you to rise for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. O merciful Creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that you must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Scott Black. Councilman Lance Smith. Excuse. Excused. Mayor Scott Tremblay. Commissioner Ron Oakley. Here. Commissioner Seth Waitman? Here. Commissioner Catherine Starkey? Here. Commissioner Gary Bradford? Here. Commissioner Jack Mariano? Here. Chairman Matt Murphy? Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, this is a call for public comment. Meeting attendees may pro provide public comment to the MPO regarding MPO and Pasco County transportation related issues or concerns. Comments are limited to three minutes in length. Persons wishing to speak must announce the following items before speaking at the time this form by the clerk. Uh, name, address, agenda item, agenda title. Um, I have three people signed up. Dennis Keigel. Good morning. So we're here from Shady Hills area. Okay. And our concern is... If you, if you would, sir, your name, your address. Uh, Dennis Kegel. Okay. And it's from the Shady Hills area, and we're here to voice our concerns about the road. Okay, we need your address. Yes. Um, we understand that there's already a plant going in, um, an no, industrial we, plant. <laughs> we need your address. Yeah. Excuse, oh, my physical, like where I live? Yes. 18205 Bosley Drive. Okay, thank you. Okay. And that would be 34610 zip code. Thank you. And um, our concern is the road. It's only a two-lane road, and it's already well over the amount of people that travel on it daily. Um, and with them adding on a plant, we, our understanding is that they're trying to change the zoning for more industrial, which we're not opposed to the growth, but we're opposed to changing and adding all this without changing anything to the road first. And what road is this? Shady Hills Road. Okay. Um, there's times that sometimes you have to sit there for like 10 minutes before you can even pull out, and it's still pretty reckless to do. It, it, it's not safe right now with adding this, the, the, everything that they're trying to add without changing the road first. Okay. Um, there's no lighting. There's no traffic lights. Um, it, it, the list just goes on and on. Okay. So what we're wanting is if we can at least get a study done prior to adding anything else. Um, we, there was a study already, I believe, and they said that they were, it, it was close to, it was like a traffic um, for trucks, like a truck route. Okay. And the, that road wasn't built for that. Okay. Um, I think we're trying, you're talking about a land use issue. We deal with just the roads itself. But right. if you well, want, before, before you leave, if you want, uh, in my office, maybe talk to Sonia Walling. Uh, we can set a meeting up. We can talk about it a little bit further as far as to what's for going the on land the effects will be. Sure. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then also, though, but for the road, prior to that, like I said, it's, is there any way we could get a study done on the road to see about getting it widened and adding some lights on it? Um, your comments will be heard, and we can take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Korovac. Good morning. Jen Kerouac, 15925 Green Glen Lane, Spring Hill. I'm from the Shady Hills area as well. And together, we just really want to, we appreciate the um, economic growth development that's 
coming in with the plant and you know we know that this is regarding traffic only and not as it relates to environmental or anything to that effect but there are some severe concerns with regards to the um, safety of Shady Hills Road um, as Mr. Kegel said um, it seems to be there's no planning no there aren't any plans currently to um, improve the roads to widen the roads to provide sidewalks for the kids within the two mile radius that are walking to school now um, and so that's a, a serious concern for the community um, you know the conditions of the road and roads in general in the Shady Hills community um, they're they're in severe disrepair and many of them because it is a bit of a impoverished area but there are folks coming in and building like six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollar homes. I've seen it all. So, um, you know, I think that the demand of the the changing to industrial and because the industrial zoning doesn't require a study for the traffic and so on, I think maybe those things are kind of being left out. And so we're just trying to band together and ask that you really take a serious look. At, at the traffic and the roads and the condition of the roads. We did a, I did a public records request um, for the accidents on Shady Hills Road just for the year of 22. So 2022, there was 468 accidents on Shady Hills Road. Really? Um, so, you know, that's our, our main concern and our main focus as far as this committee is concerned. We would really appreciate you taking a serious look at um, what appears to be a lack of preparation for the infrastructure as a result of all that's going to be coming into the area. Well, thank you very much. And it has beca become a very hot area right now, especially with the improvements on 52. We're looking at Conline line road, but um, I think I'm glad you guys have come forward to talk about that today. And, and I did drive that road coming back thank from the you. meeting. Yeah. Came up Shady Hills and came down Hayes. A lot of, lot of stuff going on. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah, it's very true. And you know, there's several folks that we've met with recently that were actually pedestrians hit by cars on that road. And so, you know, we just want the safety for the community. And, and so we appreciate your taking a look at that. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Bradford. Ma Ma did you say there was 464 accidents? 468 accidents. As that's the public oh, records, the, what I, the report that I since, have. Since when? In the year 2022. That's amazing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, see our vice mayor is in. Shall I pass the gavel, sir? Oh, certainly. Okay. We're just going to call up Stephen White for public comment. My name is Steve White. I live at 16442 Breakwater Lane, Shady Hills, Florida. I'm also here to speak about the concerns concerning Shady Hills Road. I spoke at the Planning uh, Commission in Dade City recently. Um, some of the things that were said, you know, about the, the road, and uh, we were concerned that three, three of the four schools that are on Shady Hills Road, they're parking on the shot, shot shoulder of the road. They said at the last meeting that that was not a safety issue. I beg to differ, you know, the shoulders of the roads are put there so that if the cars traveling down the road have any issues, uh, they can pull over to the side of the road. But if the side of the road is full of cars, it prohibits people from walking down the side of the road, and it does create a safety hazard. So, you know, um, those are the issues. We, we welcome the growth. We know what the county gets out of it, tax revenue. We understand what the businesses get out of it, incentives to move in, almost a million dollars to the plastics plant. But what does the community get out of it? 
I don't see anybody addressing this. At the last meeting for the residential, there was a lot of concessions from the developers to the residents, you know, in some of the new developments going in in Pasco County, yet there are no concessions to the residents in the Shady Hills area. And so, you know, that's why we're here. We are also reestablishing the Shady Hills Park and Civic Association so that we can address these issues in the community. We feel like we haven't had a voice since 1989 when the original uh, Shady Hills Civic Park and Civic Association was disbanded. So that's, that's what we're here to speak of and we appreciate any cooperation from the board. I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to attend any of those meetings as well. well great, we're gonna have one on the 23rd of this month at 7 p.m. We'd really like to hear something from Chairman. the people who are putting the plant in also. Okay. Because well, we don't know where they're getting their water. And you know, there's a lot of questions we have in the community. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. White. Commissioner Oakley. Yeah, I, their concerns are well heard and, and we listen to these concerns all the time. But with growth, you have to realize that a lot of times it takes the growth coming in before we get the mobility fees and the the monies that actually take care of building roads or building schools and take care of, they always, always seem to come last, mm -hmm. but we're hearing these all along so we know when the money is collected and those roads can be widened, we take care of it, the monies that come into us. But it's like a lot of people want to build a new school in a new residential area or a big development area. and you can't build a school until you have students, so it has to sell all the houses and all the mobility fees have to come in for that school or the roads. And when they come in, it's, it's all, it gets congested and you start seeing all that, but then that money's come in to build those roads or build those schools, and you never can build schools without students. So it always comes in after the fact. And, and it frustrates a lot of us, not only you, but us too, that uh, that has to come in after the fact, but it, it gradually comes in and then that's taken care of. But it takes time to get that in and get that taken care of, like, because we see the same thing y'all are talking about in a lot of areas in our county. So that's all. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner. Yeah, and if, if I could, I, I appreciate you guys coming out forward. As far as one of the things, as far as what did the people get out of it, uh, one of the things we're focused on in that area is creating jobs. So instead of driving down to Tampa, Pinellas, you can actually get a job right here. And that's what we're trying to do as far as trying to improve the whole economy in the area. Um, one thing good about industrial is actually it's less trips on the road. Now, great, the trucks, trucks are bigger. So the more residential with the schools, it is an issue. So I'm glad you brought it forward. We have been focused a lot on between County Light Road and getting State Road 52 done. But um, I think a few years ago we did pave the road. But I think expansion, maybe a trail going on side, it is also good additions too. But uh, appreciate you guys coming forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments while we're in the public comment section of our meeting this morning? Hearing none, thank you, everyone. Thank you for those public comments. Our next item of business is the approval of minutes of the January 12th uh, meeting. Uh, any questions, any corrections, any additions? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? Move approval. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Thank you. Next item of business are our MPO advisory committee reports, and um, we have some action items as well. Our first item under this section, um, oh wait, excuse me, our advisory committee reports. I was moving along to the action items. Welcome. I'm here to give the CAC report for March 9th, uh, well, that's today, well, last week. Uh, we had three people speak in public comment, and they had concerns for the rural Northeast Pasco and Blanton Road area, uh, specifically Blanton Road, and any road extensions or widening that was planned. Staff did ease their concerns by stating there were no plans to widen, but plans to resurface only and adding safety to the edges. Um, plans for rural Northeast adopted by the county will stay in place. Uh, the committee also approved the bylaw amendments that um, we, we were shown, and by staff recommendation, the committee postponed any decision on the transit asset management transportation system 
performance targets. That's a long title, but uh, we didn't see anything on that and postpone it till next month. Uh, we received presentation or status reports on Pasco County Vision Road development process, sidewalk project list and prioritization, and a follow up on performance safety measures. And our next meeting is next month uh, on April 5th, 2023 at 930 at the Starkey Ranch Library Col Cultural Center. I'm looking forward to that, Catherine, because I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. That'll be. Okay, thank you. Any questions uh, for the CAC committee? <laughs> thank you very much for your report. Do we have any other uh, committee reports this morning? Thank you, Tina. Good morning. Um, I'm going to read Dr. Stovall's report for you guys. Um, BPAC met at First National Bank in Pasco on March 5th at 5.45 p.m. Um, minutes are from February meeting were reviewed. Carl uh, reported on the NPO report, the construction of Ridge Road from 41 to Overpass, basically, and, and dealing with the three transportation system performance measures were postponed to a future meeting. Um, Mr. Amir Jamal was Pasco County Planning Development, presented information on the County Vision Road identification and development process. The process will help define categories of roads and their function. Important to BPAC is to include complete streets features to all county projects. County roadways to provide a safe walk bikeway as part of our road system. There was a general discussion about BPAC membership, particularly about how to continue efforts to recruit new members who represent the broadest um, version of the county and express interest in the purpose of our committee. Sidewalk needs in the county were discussed and the committee reviewed the ranking criteria and current list of sidewalk projects. It was noted that several different funding sources may be tapped for sidewalk construction and the construction needed greatly outweighs the funding every year. Um, identification of sidewalk construction needs is vital so that the project may be completed as funds become available. Um, that's about it. I do want to represent Brian Michaels was our just recently um, elected vice chair of the BPAC meeting. Michaels. Wealth of knowledge comes from Oldsmar Pinellas, so very glad to have him. Very pedestrian oriented, which is really nice to have that balance on our committee as well. Brian Michaels, a face from the past. My goodness. Good to see you, Brian. Doing very well. It has been a while. Yes. Welcome to Pasco County. Yes. Still yeah. interested in pedestrian safety issues. That's right. Very good. Very good. I know Brian had some real interesting things going on in Oldsmar. Where was the name of that intersection with the street lights? Said it was a bird. Yep. Golair Boulevard, I remember that. Brian and I were a part of the Suncoast um, League of Municipalities several years ago. And uh, so good to see you again, Brian. We got the light from here, too. That's right, you got it. <laughs> yeah. He's the man to know. Thank you, Tina. Any questions for Tina? Thank you very much. Mr. McKiska. Good morning, Carl McKiska. Uh, Technical Advisory Committee report. Uh, Scott Ferry had presented the Technical Advisory Committee bylaw amendments. There was discussion on the language regarding clarification of members' residence and the alternate's <coughs> ability to vote and attend. All members were in agreement on what was presented. Uh, the bylaws were passed on a seven to one vote. Um, Amir Jamali presented the Vision Roads development process. There were discussions on how, divi how Vision Roads are incorporated into the Long Range Transportation Plan. and. Uh, there was a suggestion of a vision road parallel to I-75 east of I-75 and north of State Route 52. Uh, Tina Russo presented the unfunded sidewalk project list and prioritization. Uh, the list included how the list is used to add projects to the lot sidewalk list to make them eligible for state funds and the time frame the state funding may become available. Uh, Jason Warren Phelps, and I apologize if I mm -hmm. got that incorrectly, who's the Public Works Director for Dade City, That's correct. presented on transportation projects in Dade City as an update to the committee. Projects included Morningside Drive from Fort King Road to U.S. Highway 301, 7th Street Improvements, U.S. Highway 98 Roundabouts at 7th Street and Old Lakeland Highway as part of the U.S. Highway 301 98 Bypass Improvements. And then Tina and Tina Russo and Johnny Coors of the MPO staff uh, presented a follow-up presentation on performance safety measures, uh, clarifying crash data and the formula for calculating vehicle miles traveled, crash types, and location of crashes. 
That concludes the report. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Any questions for Mr. McKiska? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now we'll move into the action items. Our first item that we'll consider, uh, Pasco County Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, the bylaw amendments. Um, and uh, is this you, Mr. McKiska? Uh, Mr. Johnny? Johnny Coors okay, of our Mr. staff Coors. will be presenting this. Okay. Good morning, Johnny Good morning. Coors, NPO staff. Thank you. Uh, for calendar year 2023, all of the NPO committee meetings uh, were moved to the same day. Uh, and because of that, we needed to update our the CAC bylaws. And we noticed that the CAC bylaws had not been updated since 2015. Uh, so we took the opportunity to update and refresh the CAC bylaws. Uh, the uh, county attorney participated in the review of the bylaws. So all of the amendments have also been, been vetted by a county attorney. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics on all of them, but the the purpose of the bylaw amendments was to restrict CAC membership, uh, also clarify CAC membership and composition. Uh, an amendment changed the language prescribing meeting dates, and we also added language describing the authority of the CAC chairperson. So briefly, I'm just going to go into into a couple of the of the changes. Uh, the first one is Article 4, uh, Section J, and that's in page 25 of your packet. And Section J, um, to restrict CAC membership, um, I'll just read you a couple of them. CAC members shall not reside in the same household with another CAC member. Uh, they shall not be a part of the immediate family of another CAC member. Uh, they cannot hold an elected public office. Uh, they cannot be a current member of another MPO committee. Uh, and finally, they cannot be elected officials or technical personnel directly involved with the transportation planning process. Uh, the next amendment, Article 4, Section A, in page, on page 23. Uh, basically, clarified membership and composition of the CAC. Um, this is about midway down. Uh, the CAC members shall, shall be nominated by each MPO board voting member, and all members must be residents of Pasco County, and the members identified in Table 1 shall be a resident of the commission district or municipality of the MPO board member that nominated each member. And that's just to clarify um, CAC membership. Uh, the next amendment is Article 7, Section A, and that's on page 27 of your packet. The CAC shall generally attempt to meet no earlier than 14 calendar days prior to each regularly scheduled MPO board meeting. Uh, typically, we, we have scheduled CAC meetings and all of our committee meetings now for the Wednesday before the MPO board meeting. Um, and that will that will stand. We've already scheduled those meetings for this year. Uh, finally, the same article, um, Section B, adds <coughs> some powers for the CAC um, chairperson. Uh, in the event that the chairperson becomes aware of that the CAC is unlikely to obtain a quorum, or the MPO executive director advises the chairperson that there are no matters for the CAC to consider, uh, or the governor or board of county commissioners declares a state of emergency, the CAC chairperson has the authority to cancel a CAC meeting. Uh, those are the highlights. I would like to add that none of the amendments affect how the MPO board members nominate CAC representatives or how you approve and vote on CAC members. And it also does not restrict your ability, as in the previous bylaws, to remove a CAC uh, representative for any reason um, by a majority vote of the MPO board. So not, none of that has been affected by any of the bylaws amendments. Are there any questions about the amendments? Any questions for Mr. Coors? Pretty, pretty well done, very simple changes. Uh, I know the next one we had a lot of red lines, but this is a lot, a lot easier to do, so I yes. move approval. Second. We have a motion. We have a second to approve. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. Our next item is the um, Pasco County MPO Technical Advisory Committee Bylaws Amendments, and I believe Mr. Ferry will. Good morning, Scott. You'll be speaking Good morning, on this one. Scott Ferry, Pasco MPO staff. The Technical Advisory Committee bylaws were refreshed for the same purposes and in the same manner that my colleague, Mr. Coors, just described. And the updates to all the committee bylaws were performed in a coordinated fashion in an attempt to standardize them as much as possible. So many of the details that he described hold true for the Technical Advisory Committee bylaws. The, and again, the purpose, the initial purpose for the amendment was to bring the meeting date that was recently changed for the advisory committee into conformity with the bylaws. But since all the committee bylaws were a bit dated, it was an appropriate time for the MPO staff to do a thorough review, review and refresh of the bylaws which was performed. The only significant difference between the TAC bylaws and the CAC bylaws is that the, the qualifications for serving on the Technical Advisory Committee are essentially qualification based upon their, their technical qualifications, and they are, they are not appointed based upon their, um, their location. The, uh, the changes are all detailed in the packet. Does anybody have any questions about the proposed changes? Any questions for Mr. Ferry? I have one question in general. Not, Mr. Not about changes. Who sits in this committee now and who appoints them? The MPO, the, the individuals who sit on it are all appointed based upon their technical qualifications and they represent all of the jurisdictions within Pasco County and the MPO board is who appoints those members. So, so it's not one by one, just it's a, in a group? Correct. Do we have a list of those people? Okay. Yes. I might see that list. We can get that list to Commissioner Mariano. Okay. Thank you. Do you can wish you to see it? Too? Okay. Yeah. That'll be provided to all of us, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Any further questions for Scott? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, do we have a motion to approve? Move approval. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Our next item of business, MPO Citizens Advisory Committee membership approval. And I believe this is Mr. Coors. If I may. Okay. Uh, while Mr. Coors is coming up, I'd like to extend my thanks to the team, Tina, Johnny, and Scott, for the assembly of the uh, bylaws. But also, I wanted to recognize David Goldstein of the County Attorney's Office, who was invaluable in crafting these and making them consistent with each other. We greatly appreciate his assistance. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Coors. For Johnny Coors, uh, MPO staff again. Uh, for this month's um, game of CAC member Jenga, uh, uh, we are requesting that Mr. Clint Wynn, who is a current District 4 representative, be moved to an at-large position to reflect his change of address. And Jim Engelman, who is currently an at-large member, uh, now resides in District 4. And District 4 has a primary uh, CAC opening. So we are requesting that, that Jim Engelman be moved to District 4 representative and Mr. Clint Wynn moved to an at-large position. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. And we have a motion, Commissioner Bradford, seconded Commissioner Starkey. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Johnny. Appreciate it. Next, we have our Go Pasco update. Good morning. Good morning. 
Francisco Pasco, director. Welcome. Just um, would like to update you on our ridership for the past six months. It has been going up. Um, we have um, about 250,000 riders in the past four months. And this is a positive um, activity for us because it, we're moving forward, we're growing, uh, we're providing the service. Uh, we're projecting to have about 10 percent of um, ridership increase for between fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23. And uh, typically, um, agencies only have 3%, so hopefully we can, we can achieve that goal. Um, on other items that we have, um, we, conduct, we are uh, finishing up with our scope of work for the route study. Um, Carter has been helping us to develop this scope, so um, we're just tweaking it, and we'll be out on the street hopefully in a couple months. Um, we have six new buses coming up in May, that's confirmed, and we will be um, ordering four more. Our, unfortunately, our um, equipment is old and, use, and made already their useful life, so um, we are in the, in the process of um, creating a more aggressive uh, replacement program, so we are not in this um, bind right now. Um, and um, we are also looking at purchasing a CAD AVL system, so it will help us to locate the vehicles at any time. And that's uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. you. Any questions, questions for with the Go Pasco report? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Our next item of business is the um, Pasco County um, Vision Road Development Process presentation. Good morning. Good morning. This is Amir Jamali, uh, Senior Transportation Planner with Planning and Development, Pasco County. Today I want to present uh, <coughs> some elements or some transportation elements in Pasco County Comprehensive Plan. Uh, we have two major transportation elements in the Pasco County Comprehensive Plan, uh, including Vision Roadway Map, which includes all of the major roadways in the County and corridor preservation table, which provides built out design for those major roadways that are included in the vision map. We hear these two elements a lot in the planning documents or public hearings. That's why we want to discuss how they have been established and how they play a role in the planning process. Uh, before getting into county vision map, I want to discuss how or why we need a roadway network system for the county in the planning process. Uh, as we all know, roadway network consists a bunch of intersection and roadway segments. And roadway network uh, serve as a back backbone for the planning tra transportation planning purposes. In order to have a, an efficient roadway network, we use functional classification to classify the roadways into different classes and groups to give each roadway segment a specific role in the system. Pasco County considers three types of roadways in the vision map. Uh, first one is arterial, which are the roadways that carry the most of the through traffic between the major or great communities. Those are the high-speed roadways with limited access. Uh, on the right side, you see a graph which shows the mobility versus accessibility for each type of the roadway. As you see for the arterials, they are expected to serve uh, mobility and a little bit of just accessibility. The next type of roadway we have is collector roadways. Uh, as you can guess, they collect the traffic from the local roadways and transfer the traffic to arterials. They are not as high speed as uh, arterials, uh, but they are still access limited or access control roadways. And on the right side, you can see in the graph, they are expected to serve both mobility and accessibility. And the last type of the roadway we have is local roadways. Basically, they are access roadways. They are just providing access uh, from single or individual destination origin, origins to the collectors and arterials. And as you can see on the graph, they are just expected to serve accessibility, not providing capacity for true traffic. 
Uh, Pasco County, I think, I believe in maybe 15, 20 years ago, they have uh, established a highway vision map with some considerations. For example, the first consideration was they have considered a, net, a roadway network with high degree of connectivity to provide multiple options to get into different destinations. And that's why we see have uh, a lot of uh, parallel east, west, or north, south corridors in their vision map. Uh, also, the county has considered a roadway network with a network this, the density appropriate to the land use patterns and area form. For example, it's been tried to not cross uh, wetland areas. And the other consideration is the county has considered a network with more frequently spaced roadways as opposed to spare networks. That's why we prefer to have, for example, uh, two, four lane parallel roadways, not uh, an eight lane roadway. Uh, like other transport, uh, like other elements in the comparison plan, we can update or amend the highway vision map. Uh, they have to go through the normal process as other transport elements, and they have to be heard by planning commissioners and two public hearings by board of the county commissioners for their approval. And we have some triggers to update the uh, functional classification or highway vision map. Some of them are like number of lanes or construction of new roadways, or if you want to add or reclassify a existing roadways. Uh, comparison plan has some criteria for reclassification of existing roadways to upgrade or downgrade of a existing roadway. Uh, as you can see, we have some characteristics for each roadway like arterials and collectors. For example, we have uh, average daily traffic criteria on arterial for different areas like rural and urban areas. Uh, once we have a roadway network, it's time to determine the, their build-out design. That's where corridor preservation table comes to the picture. Uh, corridor preservation table provides corridor widths and number of lanes for each roadway segment. To determine the number of lanes, we have uh, projected traffic volumes in the build-out area of the county to come up with the number of lanes. And for the corridor width, we use the adopted typical cross-sections. Uh, based on their number of lanes, we have a specific right-of-way widths for each roadway. And as you can see in the picture, for each cross-section, we have different elements, including sidewalks, bike lane, uh, 11 foot uh, traffic lane, and landscaping and utilities. Can I, can I ask you a question about yes. that one? Commissioner Starkey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, back, back one. That two feet, is that <coughs> between, oh, I see, so we have, we have nine feet between the curb on the left-hand side for the sidewalk, but only three feet for the multi-use path on the right. And um, it just, is, where does that number come from? Three feet for multi-use path is 12 feet. I see it three feet from the curb to the trail, to the edge of the pavement. Yes. For On the other side, you have from, nine. Yeah, there is distance between curb and multi-use path. I think it's been so that, for so landscaping. Yeah. My, my problem with that is there's no room for any plantings to shade a trail, to shade, to shade the, the path. But I think on the left side, you can see we have you have nine feet on the left. Landscaping, but is something that we can play. We can put some of that feet along the right side mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. It's not so some restricted. Most people are going to be be using the multi-use path, and, um, <coughs> and and if you only have three feet, you can't put any any shade. And the other thing that a, a tree will do between the bike lane and the path is protect you if a car goes off. And I don't know if you remember what happened on. Um, Keystone or Tarpon Springs Boulevard where the car went off the road and hit that couple that on um, the tandem bike that they used to come to our market all the time. They're probably on the way to our market 
when they got killed mm. because the car went off the road. There's nothing separating them from the trail that was right next to the road. So I just wonder if we wouldn't maybe take two feet from the left side where it says nine feet between the sidewalk and the curb. And if you add even two feet on the right, does that get you the ability to put any kind of shade or protective measures for those using the, the multi-use path? And again, I've, sh I've showed, I don't know if I showed it here at the MPO, but I've showed you what they're doing in other counties. And, and you've seen it when we go on, when we go on um, road trips. If you look, people are, most counties are putting much more space between the curb and their multi-use path. Leon County and Capital C Circle, uh, Sarasota, Mancy, ev everybody's putting more. So I think we could do better. Yeah, I think we, they are subject to change once they come into PD&E design or the development process. It's not something that restricted that we have to do 9-11 on left or 3-2 or on the right side. You do have that flexibility to yeah, move so. some of that over to the right side instead of in the left side. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Incorporate that for even for future planning to make sure you have enough for a tree line, just you know, for safety features, as Commissioner Starkey says, but also just to make it more attractive for um, usage of the trail. Yes, understood. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Mariano. Yeah, a couple of things that you got to be careful too with, this, with the sidewalks, trails, et cetera. If you're going to put like an oak tree and those roots grow up, mm -hmm. you're going to rip up the sidewalk. So you got to be careful what you're going to put out there. Palm yeah. tree, yeah, different some, control. But, but, there's other, but it can be done. <laughs> no, no, yeah, just gotta be, just gotta be, you just got to be careful what you put out the there. Yeah. And I heard the cathedral oak is really, is much better with its root system um, too in terms of roadside um, you know so there are oaks that can be used that are not quite as detrimental to your your sidewalk your infrastructure but um, yeah but you I understand you do have to be careful about that and let me ask you a question do we know what the difference in cost is between let's say a five foot sidewalk and a 12 foot meandering path I'm assuming the path is made out of asphalt oh, I don't know so, so, do you know, so? <laughs> <laughs> No, not offhand? Okay. Well, I, mean, it, it's not, I think it's something to consider. And, and maybe the reason that they're putting the five foot path here is to, if they have a change to go to the multi use path, they got the room that's set, set up there as well. You may have a champion here, Commissioner Moriani. He may have an answer for you. 10 minutes? Okay. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Who can I send my little video to so we c I can show you something? Would I email it? S. Dupree, two E's. Uh, e. D. Wait. S. D. U. P. R. E. Z. D. U. P. R. E. Z. At. Okay. We're going to get to watch a video, Catherine. Yep. Oh boy. So if I could, Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. So if you see the difference from both sides, from with the from the bike lane over on both sides, it's a total of 24 feet. It's just a matter of what you want to put there. I think eventually, like at Leon County, they have them on both sides of the road. That may be the ultimate way to go. But when Sam gives the, the cost number, it may even show that we may you want to look, at, look at that even more. We can, we don't have to wait for it. Yeah, if you'd like to um, continue on the mirror. Okay. It didn't work. Uh. Okay, yeah, uh, corridor preservation table has some additional notes or considerations. For example, we may ask for additional right of way at the intersections because if we have uh, do any improvements, the alignments shown in the map are all conceptual unless we have an approved PD&E for roadways. Uh, special districts like VOPH and Connected City Master Roadway Plan supersedes the requirement of the corridor preservation table and all of the roadways in northeast rural area will remain as two lane to uh, keep the nature of uh, rural areas in that uh, region. 
I'm done, unless you have any question for me. Okay. Are, are we ready on that yet, Sally? Or, okay. Any questions for uh, Amir while we're waiting on our video? Um, Mr. Makiska. If I could, part of the reason for having this presen brought, presentation brought before you today is the MPO will be launching its long-range plan soon, and we will consider issues such as this as a matter of policy in that document. Simultaneously, the county is working on their comprehensive plan, and we are coordinating with their staff, and again, the vision roads are in there as well. And so I wanted to plant the seed for everyone to be thinking towards that long-range plan, the policies that we can put into there, and also to consider not only vision roads, but do we want to have vision trails, vision transit, other elements that we could use in that policy document, which is also a programming document, to shape the future of Pasco County. And so I thought this was an excellent presentation just to get you thinking in that direction as we start to bring elements of the long-range plan before you over the next 18 or so months. Very good. You say, excuse me, Mr. Roach, Jim. You say the uh, vision trails are a part of this? Currently, there are not vision trails, but one of the things I'm suggesting for you to contemplate is we have vision roads currently. Do we want to expand that concept to other transportation facilities, whether it would be trails, transit, so forth? But that way, we can put something on Pasco map or on a map and sort of hold it while we get to that then ultimate implementation but it would protect a corridor should we need it for future use. Right. I would, I would definitely think we need to put vision trails of, as part of that because we don't know some where all those vision roads are going to come out and some areas have been kind of left out to connect some of our vision roads. So maybe, you know, for the vision trails to go in. So as we're working on those, we don't want to miss a new vision road that could have a nice trail on that would connect to those other trails we're already putting in. So it'd be a good part of uh, the exercise is, is include those in part of the vision roads. So make that part of the checklist, you know. Yeah. So it's better to ahead of time than after the road's built, right, Catherine? Find out that the trail's not there. Yeah. You've already yeah. found there was a little uh, <laughs> missing gap on, yeah. on some of our vision trails over on the east side because Incorporate that in the checklist, yeah. Catherine doesn't come over my way that much. But <laughs> she is she out. Is, she is checking definitely out. in charge of, of all the trails in the county, so <laughs> I've got to get her back over my way a bit to <laughs> look at those vision roads, too. So. Okay, so what I, what I just did was I took some snapshots of my video from Leon County, so I just sent three photos to you if you can pop those up. Hopefully we'll see three photos in, in lieu of a video then. Yeah. Okay, very okay. good. And while those are being pulled up, I do want to add as a point of clarification the dialogue that was just occurring. Vision roads do include the multi-use path alongside it for a standalone trail that is not adjacent to a roadway. That is what I was uh, trying to allude to with the idea of a they, vision they trail. connect to your vision road. You know, I mean... Especially in the uh, northeast rural area where... I've, been trying to talk about equestrian trails. We want to be sure that those are included and, and, yeah. and match up so we can have that go out to the green swamp in those areas where it can be used by horseback riders and all, not just walkers or people walk all the time, but also for those people that, um, well, ride horses or even do bike ride can, can use those trails to to connect to other parts of our county, especially on the east side. Well, what Leon County has done has extended down into Wakulla County, too, with that St. Mark's oh, yeah, trail and you know, the trails yeah. that go along 98 and everything in the network. It, it's really exciting when you see how all these things can tie together, the, the trails that are part of the highway system as well as the other trails in the vicinity and tying them all together. And I think that's important. Commissioner Mariani. Yeah, so with the Carter Preservation Tables that we have, that we have these right-of-ways that we just took a look at, are you saying in addition to the Carter Preservation on the roads that we don't have that on on these tables, are you looking at those outside these Carter, Carter Preservation Tables? So the Carter Preservation Tables include space or an allotment, if you will, for a multi-use path. Right. 
Uh, conceptually, we could also be looking at if there would be a trail that would not be associated with a roadway, a standalone independent facility. Okay. Um, so for example, the Sun Coast has a trail next to it that's part of the roadway right. design. Okay. Mm -hmm. We could look at having vision trails that are just standalone facilities. Okay, so it's just trails outside this yeah. card of preservation. I think it's a good idea. Pretty good. Okay, Sonia just left. Did we, did we get the photos? Yep, they're about to come up. Okay, and I may have, oh, so no. this is, this is Leon County. This is Capitol Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one photo and then you can see see what they're doing there. And you see the trail continuing on down the road. And see where their light poles are? <laughs> we seem to put our light poles right where uh, on the other side and they, they interfere on the trail. I don't know, I, I was, when I rode, drove 52 to the board meeting Tuesday and I was looking at the sidewalk on Pross, on 52 and like, how are we gonna make that into a trail? I mean, we, we would have to move all the light poles because they're on the outside edge of the sidewalk instead of the inside edge where th these guys have it. And um, so I just, I've never thought about light placement before, but it seems like we're <laughs> doing it on the other side. Okay, and one more picture. Oh, just three. That's the third one. Oh, oh, you did three? Okay. Well, see that? That's a totally different experience than slamming that up against two feet from the road. So, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Commissioner Mariano. Uh, Commissioner Stark, I think that's a great idea as far as taking a look at the placement of these poles. They don't even look to be as bulky as the ones that maybe have to reach over further. We have a bigger base on it. So maybe it is something we can take a look at. Yeah. So you'll notice in this picture here that those light poles are on the opposite side of the trail on that left side. Hmm. These are next between the road and the sidewalk on the right, but on the left, on the they're on, on the, the left side. I don't know if there is a trail on the left-hand side. Um, so it looks like some kind of walkway over there, but. That's the, that's the lane going the other way, hmm. on, on the other side of the median. Notice the median, though, isn't oh, is that Oh, is this nice? a uh, six foot, This six is a lane? state road, by the way. <coughs> county, county circle, the <coughs> six circle. Three. Okay, right. it's Route uh, 363, yeah. uh, Capital Circle Southeast. I'm familiar with this. Um, I used to own a home right near there and would ride that trail. Yeah. Uh, the right-of-way footprint is very wide here, and that path does then meander back and forth. Um, and, and some sections of it is quite a ways off the roadway. Yeah, this is a new road. Um, can you go back to the one before? Just I want to kind of keep an eye on the lights. Well, we may not see it on the other side. Okay, and go back one more. No. Yeah, it's those yeah. two are on I, the right hand side. I have a video so. I can look at if there's, I don't know if there's I'm a I'm just not seeing the road. road. I was thinking the, the part I'm seeing is, it's probably the road I'm seeing and then the lights. Yeah, which, that's what I think. Which I'm not picturing the three lanes over there. Yeah. So it doesn't show it in that picture that well, but. And three lanes on each side, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I gather that now, yeah. Any further questions from Mr. Jamali? Thank you very much, Amir. You. Appreciate Thank your presentation. Very interesting. Um, item number six, our 2023 Citizens Advisory Committee, the application update. And I believe this is you, Mr. Coors. Yes, good morning again. Uh, Johnny morning. Coors, MPO staff. The MPO staff, as well as county staff, have begun getting CAC applications. <clears throat> I have been emailing those to you and your staff as they have been coming in. Uh, this is mostly just to put the applications on the record and starting as soon as possible, whether it's April or May, uh, I would like to start um, being able to submit action items to nominate and approve CAC members uh, if you guys are prepared for that. Uh, mainly, I just want to update the applications that we have been getting and also make sure they are getting to you and your staffs. Um, if you would like, uh, when you're ready to nominate a member, if you will uh, reach out to me or Carl and we'll put an action item on the agenda and we can also send the prospective representative calendars or any other information that you would like. I just wanna make this as easy for you guys as possible so we get 
good CAC uh, representative. Um, I, I've been I've been going through the um, printouts that you have of different people, and I do see an error um, on John Post's uh, application. The front page you have John Post's information, but on the back side you have Nadine Ferguson's information. So. Um, Okay, that may have been how these were printed out, two-sided, two so I'll, yeah. I'll make sure that and the she's, application She's got her stuff printed out correctly somewhere else, but somehow she got added to the back of John Post. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Um, Commissioner Mariano. So if the board members that have these applications, especially for two, three, and four, if they wanted to make the um, announcement or the recommendation, they could do it even right now, correct? Uh, do we need an action item for the agenda if they would like to go ahead and make a nomination? That I'm not. Um, I'm sorry, I was looking at. I'm sorry, I was looking at the materials in the packet. We, um, we, have, we have the applications here. Can a board member, if they choose to, especially from two, three, and four, make a nomination right now, if they wanted to? Mr. Goldstein, do you have a, an opinion on that? I think you can. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Coors? Commissioner Bradford? Mr. Chair, I'm ready to move forward with mine. Okay, okay. Go proceed. Yes. A lot of applications. Mm -hmm. Just one. Mm -hmm. This would be, this would be for an what alternate for you because what Jim Engelman is now your primary. Um, that, was, that was voted on at the, um, in the action item earlier in the agenda? Correct. Okay, so this will be your alternate? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. My alternate is uh, Brad Solsenberry. Uh, Brad is a uh, uh, a veteran. He uh, served in the United States Army. He uh, worked at the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he is. Let's see. He has a degree f uh, in social studies. Uh, Mikey, he is uh, part of the uh, Rotary Club. Uh, he's part of the Pasco Safety Stand Down for Veterans, volunteers at Veterans uh, Factories in the American Legion. Uh, he is a member of. I'm gonna I'm gonna crush this one. The Phi <laughs> Alpha Honor Society for Superior Academic Achievement, which he is, and I am definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Although we put he lives in District 12, so I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> 12. Yeah. I do check all the I do check the addresses just to make sure that they are. That and they are it, correct, it cracks so. me up. So many of these people have said they don't live in the unincorporated part of the county, hmm. so they don't relate. I think we have citizenry who don't quite understand that we part do. of us yet. We do. Yes. So if he lives in District 4, what? This is with the information I have. I reside, I, I reside in Commission District 4. Okay, so someone corrected that for you. Correct. Right, we did have a, an application <laughs> that said 12. Right, <laughs> so he has, and it's on the back of his voter registration card. So we got, his precinct uh, number. We got the, the, uh, uh, the proof where he lives and all that kind of stuff. I would like to, okay. I would like to nominate him. So we have a motion for Brad Solberger. Um, we have a second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of appointing uh, Brad Solberger, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Thank you. Who's District Thank Two? You. Is that Seth? Right. You got a lot of applications. Yeah. The uh, our applicant is waiting for one more step from approval. He's. Uh, uh, works for Marco Rubio's office, so they're checking yeah. with okay. checking with their staff, and so we should be ready in April. Okay, and the applications do not come directly to me, so they come to county staff, and they are forwarded to me. So as I get them, I have been um, sending them on to you guys and your staff, which I will continue to do. Right, and I have one more. I have two two in. Oh, no, I think I have three in, but I have one more that I reached out to, and I'm just waiting for an answer. But I have to select two. I have to select a, a primary regular and, an and an alternate. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll be ready for the next meeting. Okay. Are, are my um, selections, they already being served, or are they full? 
Yes, we have one. had some movement. Let me, and we do have the, let me check and make sure. And they have to live in our district for us to appoint them? Yes, they do have to uh, reside in your district and you will, and you are the one that will nominate them. I had one attorney who lives in, uh, I believe he lives in Sess there, I believe, yeah. Troy Stevenson is the one I had to put an application in. Be a good member on be that large or I guess, but. I will look at the list um, and make sure. Check that out and just get back to me on it. Be yes, fine. I'll do that in a few minutes. Yes, can you? Um, the one student is the current head Yes. Any other questions for Mr. Coors while we're waiting for this answer? If you would like also, I will, uh, if you uh, have somebody that you would like to nominate, I will reach out to them and provide them with all the information, make sure they can attend the meetings. They are at, they are at 9.30 a.m. I know that's hard for some working people to get to to get to the meetings, so I will um, I'll reach out to them and provide them any information that you would like me to once, you, once you've um, identified someone you'd like to nominate. Thank you. A little bit easier to get to that meeting, Tina? So anybody interested in that group? Are we short of people on the BPAC? A few, and we advertised it. Um, Commissioner Edwin's one of the district or commissioner chair was recruiting a guy on that as well. Again, BPAC, we have a little bit more because brand new bylaws have a little bit more wiggle room um, for expertise and technology um, as well. Okay, we see the list here uh, on our screens of the vacancies, and of course I, we've filled the one I now with Commissioner Bradford's district. Um, and so uh, these are some uh, vacancies we can work on filling. That's a question, uh, Commissioner Sam? Mariano. Um, if somebody sits as an alternate, right, they're not going to get used that much. They can go to the meetings, et cetera. Can you alternate? Can you nominate someone to be on BPAC that could still be your alternate on the regular CAC? The updated CAC bylaws state that you can only be a sitting member of one MPO board committee. Mm -hmm. I think okay. that would apply even to alternates. alternates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any further questions on this item? Okay. Hearing none, we're going to move over to our next item, item seven, the sidewalk project uh, list and prioritization. And I believe we're going to have uh, both uh, Ms. Russo and Mr. Benick on this one. Thank you. So I'm going to do the intro. Tina Russo, MPO staff, active transportation planner. Welcome. We're bringing this um, item to you because in the next month or so, you'll be seeing our list of prior projects. One of the items on that list of prior projects are called our transportation alternative applications, which are a couple of our sidewalk projects. So we just want to make you aware of the sidewalk process and the sidewalk list that you'll see today. So when next month when we start looking at our TA applications, you're not going to see all those sidewalks on that list, just to kind of let you know of the process <laughs> that's been going on in the last year or so due to the two-mile school situation, and Sam's going to present that to you as well. But this is kind of a lead-up for when we start going into our prioritization project list as well. Thank you. Project Manager. <laughs> Sam. I'm Sam Benick with uh, Pasco Project Management. Um, and to your earlier question about the cost difference between sidewalks and multi-use paths, I mean, Give me all the asterisks and you know <laughs> caveats of of a 10-minute analysis but uh, if you are building the two facilities next to an existing roadway and that's the only addition you're making there is a um, the the mixed-use path is not quite double the sidewalk cost but it is considerably more uh, per linear foot whereas if you are in a in the same 
roadway footprint. You're not doing any additional clearing and grubbing. You're not doing any additional mo MOT. It's just being built as MOT. Uh, maintenance of traffic. Okay. So if you're building a, along a roadway that's not yet open to traffic, almost, well, all of that difference goes away and it's a wash. So if, if the roadway is already, you know, if the, the right of way is already being, um, the width is set based on your corridor preservation, and all your clearing and grubbing limits are the same, and you're just talking about, well, are you building concrete versus trail in the same exact footprint? And if you're not talking about maintaining traffic, it's six and one half dozen of the other, which facility you build. So let's think about that for a minute, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Um, so if we could get a trail 12 feet wide or a five foot path, what would you rather have? A <laughs> 12 foot. You got well, all and, kinds and that, of modes of I mean, to be coming. fair, that's only in a situation where you're building essentially a, a new roadway. Um, if you're if you were doing a, a widening project where or or if if you are needing to add additional construction area to accommodate the the trail versus the the sidewalk, then then yes, there is you know there's additional cost for that additional clearing. And but if if everything else is the same, just the cost of the concrete versus the asphalt, you're, you're, cor you're on the right track, that they're very okay. comparable. I, I, was, I was wondering if they would be, and, and being that you have the right-of-way set on that one analysis you showed us, <clears throat> same 24 foot here, 24 foot there, you can put it in there. I don't know why we just don't put them all in for asphalt and just make, make 12 foot wide trails. Any new roadway, we should make that a policy. I would get rid of that five foot uh, on the street, but I think Sam likes to ride on those. I mean, who ri who? Some people like to ride on the street, and they call them bike lanes. But then I think transportation I'm people say, well, that's where if your lane. car breaks down, you pull over. <laughs> so then what happens to the cyclist? But I I'd rather put that as a multi-use trail. Then I mean, I don't I wouldn't want my kid riding on the street. I agree. That five foot strip that's no. full of glass and rock, and we don't clean those. There's a lot of them riding out on. Uh, they like the challenge, I think. They like to put their lives Blanton on the line. <laughs> yeah, Blanton Road gets a lot of bikers. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's a different nice. situation. Well, keep in mind, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so keep in mind, the, the graph they showed us is the bike lane's still there. I we're know, not, We're not making that choice. Day. So that's still there. That's in place. It's just whether you put a five foot path, <clears throat> we have a little bit more green space, or you put a 12 foot wide path. Same cost on a new road. Well, I really think we should look to make this a policy. It's so a little more. I think it's a, I think it's a little more right away. Well, and I think that I would want to come back to you with a little bit more firm numbers too, because I mean, I was, I was using like the highest of high level numbers sure. to, to make my comparison there. And I didn't get into things like, you know, wetland impact minimization. And, um, so, I mean, there, there are a number of factors, but, um, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we, I certainly heard, heard your point and, and, see the numbers that I have, you know, it's something that I want to look at a little bit more in depth, you know, when we do have a, a new native road or, or um, brand new roadway alignment, you know, should we be planning that sidewalk on one side trail on the other, if in practical terms, they cost the same amount and one of them clearly has a better level of service than the other. I mean, if you're going to be a biker, you're going to want to ride in the asphalt, right? Well, if you get more room for more people, whether it be going to school or wherever, if it fits, and, I, and frankly, whether it be even if a 12 foot was a little bit more money and a 10 foot was less, between those two foot, I wouldn't even mind either way. But I think if we can get that extra double or more, then that's an asset we should use if we can get it. So situations like we just went through on uh, the Clinton Ave extension, the new State Road 52 <laughs> yeah. w wouldn't happen. We'd, we'd have that policy in place, so, so nobody would be making the decision to say, well, we don't need it here. It's automatically in the plan. Would it be the pleasure of this board that we bring this conversation to one of our next meetings That's to kind of idea. look at a, um, and this is a perfect and, time, uh, and the reason why we had the vision road conversation preservation was to kind of bring up this conversation about different facilities, different users, we have different types of roadway, whether it be rural, collector, so all those things kind of play into that, so it'd be a really good discussion for us to have at a future date looking at those facilities as well. 
I'm a cyclist. There's some roads I love to ride on where there's a multimodal lane or bike lane, and there's some roads that I, I just don't feel as safe. So that's a big part of this conversation that goes on with the cycling community as much as everybody else. So we would love to bring that to you at a Let's later date that. with a little bit more information. Let's do that. Okay. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Sam. Sure. Sorry. I Sorry, I'm not confident in my numbers. No, 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 right. Well, 10 minutes, no pressure on you, Sam. Hey, numbers, can, <laughs> yeah. numbers can change anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, but to why I'm actually here, I uh, appreciate Tina and the uh, MPO staff uh, bringing us in. We have been at the county working on um, a, an extended list of, of bicycle and pedestrian uh, priorities um, that, that goes well beyond the, the list of priority projects and, and just wanted to make you aware of that and our, our process. Um, generally speaking, um, these requests come in from your offices, the citizens, um, more or less anybody uh, can submit a, a request. They, they get funneled either through public works, traffic operations, or, or, um, or your, your assistance back to me. Um, and, and the rest of the project management team. Um, and then we, we track those requests um, as much as we can. We'll combine them into logical projects, uh, may add, them, add a request to a project that's already on the list, um, and, and try and, and make that into a, a cohesive project. Uh, and we actually will, will develop these projects uh, conceptually at a staff level into something that, that makes logical sense that you would actually go out and build. Um, and then once, once we have a, a project concept, if you will, then those concepts are compared against each other. They're, they're ranked with the scoring criteria. Uh, it looks at um, safety factors, uh, including those on the screen here. Um, and there's different point values assigned to each of these different factors. Um, we try and use measures that are very objective um, and, and not things that, that get into a lot of subjectivity so that we're, we're always comparing apples to apples, you know, year after year as we're doing this over and over again. We're applying the same criteria each time around. Um, we're also looking at connectivity factors, um, and, and these, you know, often relate to, to the, the projects around. And this is really where we get into... Um, developing our projects into what makes logical sense. We want to build facilities that connect to existing facilities that, that build out a network that is a connected network um, and not just, you know, building a project that leaves our next gap, leaves our next request, you know, bringing it to, um, to where we can connect to that transit stop or that next sidewalk down the road. Um, the last of our factors um, are, are the land uses and the time. Um, the connecting the different land uses together, really giving people purpose to use the facilities, um, you know, being able to go from home to the park or, or to, uh, you know, their work location and so forth. So uh, those projects that actually make those connections um, get those additional points. And then our years unfunded, that is just the number of years that a project has been on our list and has not received funding uh, up to a maximum of five uh, points can be assigned there. So, you know, give a little bit of help to projects because unfortunately sometimes they, well, often they do sit for a number of years. And I wish I could say that this was the entire unfunded list, but this is just page one of two. Um, and, and we are... Uh, this is why we have a process, right, is so that as we are looking at these year after year, as we're building our capital plan, um, we're, we're picking the projects that are the highest ranked each year. Um, Tracy Overturf on our team is our, our program manager. Um, primarily, we're looking at Penny for Pasco uh, funding to, to attack this list, but when we do have other funding sources available and we work with the LOPP to um, to, to fund projects that way, um, look for you know state funding as it's appropriate. Um, but we we have just moving down the list. As you can see, there's some on here that I haven't been able to to fully uh, vet yet um, to score. Um, but we are every year as we develop our new process, we'll we'll go back to this list and um, and get the uh, the highest ranked projects and work in the ones that we're able to afford. Mr. Chairman? 
Mr. Commissioner Mariano. So as I, I look at the list, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, Jasmine was funded, Zimmerman mm -hmm. is being funded. We're trying to work a joint project with DOT to kind of like make the roadway shift to the side to make it safer. Um, and Ranch Road is being funded as well. So those were ones that were sitting for a long, long time. So I'm glad to see those gone. I will say that safety has got to be, I think, a bigger factor. Um, someone mentioned to me just the other day we were talking about Old Dixie Highway. Uh, we have it going up to the park now at SunWest Park. Two-lane road, we just dropped at, at Tuesday's board meeting, we just dropped the speed limit down from 40 to 30 to make it safer. But just as everybody may be familiar or maybe not, oh, you've got a yeah. simple two-lane road that's there right now. Uh, there's a development coming in that may put a sidewalk on that part, but they're being shipped over to say it's going to be on the other side of the road where it's swift mud, first forever Florida land going up Old Dixie. And that's a roadway that you have no options. If you're driving a bike, if you're riding a golf cart, whatever it may be, if there's two cars coming. That's Leonard. This, I've been this, working on that for 15 this, this, years. There's a, there's, a, there's a big issue there. And with ditches full with water, whatever, it's a dangerous situation. Without lights at night, it's, it, it is a big issue. So I think those should be looked at a little bit closer because especially if you get people driving up Old Dixie and they can be on that side path going up, that keeps them off 19 as well mm -hmm. to make it safer. Uh, another thing that's on the list, you've got River Gulf way down the list. Mm -hmm. And just two years ago, this MPO board voted it to be number one. Mm -hmm. Now, we did try to get money from the state. We thought we were going to get some grants out. It, it didn't happen. But I think if you're going to go and try to get federal money for safety grants that were out there at, at the NACO conference, there was money that was left that still hasn't been used yet for safety. And I'm going to tell you, I think if we go and look for a federal grant, and we've got ranked something number 30 as opposed to number one to try to get federal money for that, which might be enough money to pay for the whole thing, pay for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. If you have this this far down the list, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. I think the electives, when they look to put a list together, we know what our community needs. And even though it may not fit a formula that you know just is, is set up and, and, and looked at and numbers assigned to it, I don't think it represents what we should be looking at, and I think that project there should go back up to the top of the list. So the good news is both Old Dixie and Cody River Underpass are currently on our LOP um, already. So, and you will look at that list starting next month. So that ranking, and Sam and I had a pretty good discussion with, um, you know, our multi-use paths are on a different list for DOT funding. Mm -hmm. So that's his tracking project list, your LOP will be a different list that prioritizes funding from DOT, and that's what we're going to start with next month. And again, those those two projects are on the LOP. You will look at them. They'll be ranked according to our system, which is safety number one, with the flexibility to be able to move it wherever you want. So we're doing an um, updated study for, for Old Dixie, hopefully, with the help of FDOT. We're also looking at uh, updated study, feasibility study, a little bit further than a feasibility study for the Cody River underpass to see what is needed for that, the connections on either side as well. So those are already on our list of priority projects. You'll see those in the next month or two, and they'll be ranked according to that list as well. If, if I could, uh, I'd also like to see Shady Hills Road looked at as far as getting it on this list. Um, and if we needed to, I want to go outside the window of just looking at um, Penny for Pasco money per se for... Shady Hills is here. Okay. Um, let's go look at a funding source for that. Because if I've got, let's say, a 300-acre industrial park, I've got another plastics company we just paid a lot of money for, they're not paying us impact fees. Like a developer, we can come in, we can go make them, go put a sidewalk alongside. We get concessions from them to go forward. But when we passed the Penny for Pasco this past time, we said that if we have an economic development project for transportation, which could be a trail along a sidewalk, we can go use that. And I think especially with big trucks going up and down a two-lane road with no sidewalks on the side, we don't want to see another Moon Lake situation with kids getting run over. Let's go get ahead of the game. Let's go look at using the economic development money for when these developments come in and, and try to associate. Let's go put that money toward. They're not contributing, so we can't use their money in kind to, to direct it here as a pipeline project. but. We can use economic development money to say, look, if we're going to have these trucks coming in, we need to make it safer. I know that's what Clay's doing on a couple of projects right now. They're on that list as well. So, as, and that would be the county that looks at that. 
and and even um, I should say if if there is a, another county project uh, in the vicinity of one of these, we're we're even bringing those into that same same design and construction. So if if there's like a you know we're not going to build a roadway project right next to where we now know that we have a bicycle and pedestrian need and not build the two at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're trying to to join those and get that that savings. And in Moon Lake Road, we did. Put the, we did fix the roadway, made some great improvements there. We got more right away, and we put the trail on one side. We got room for it on the other side later on. But I think with da David Goldstein here, hopefully David <coughs> can kind of pick up on this as these developments come in. Let's go take a look at that opportunity that, that could be out there for, for another funding source that I don't think, I don't know of any, any project we've used yet. I mean, we couldn't have used it because we just passed it and we haven't collected the money for it yet. So I think coming up, it's something to put in a plan to get it, get it laid out. Having come back on the MPO after being off for several years, I had this question. There's 17th Street in Dade City, Meridian uh, to Lock Street. Is there anything on south of uh, Meridian, like from Coleman Avenue south on 17th Street, on the south end of several blocks from Meridian? So, and probably next month I'll bring that to you because we're actually working. We were going to kind of move forward with a project because it is on our list of prior projects. It's also on their list. We're combining with Day City and the county. I'm working on that whole stretch. You know there's some right-of-way issues on some of those locations. So we're actually working with the county, Dade City, on making that a whole project together. Um, so we're kind of moving forward with those. And there's several projects with Dade City that we're moving forward with as well, working with them um, on different funding sources. And then, like Sam said, working with other projects as well. But that's one that we're working on now. Thank we you. were going to move forward, but the county's doing something, and we're going to work with Dade City and making it a whole project. And right away is an issue when it comes to 17th Street there, especially does, a little bit north of Meridian there. Does the school board get involved in any of that too, like around Pasco High School Stadium Drive? And you know, since that's you know, those sidewalks are needed for getting the children to school, the pedestrian traffic. And we're working with school board on sidewalks on their property. They're doing a little bit better job of doing that well, but we're working with them. And that again, that's sitting with that group as well and making that connectivity on the school property. Again, they're responsible for the school property and then everybody else is responsible outside that school property. So it's connecting those dots again. But if we all three come to the table, that's we can maybe right. get it done. Yeah, that, so that, that section south of Meridian, you know, several blocks, like about Coleman, I think is where the sidewalk's cut off, and, and going further south. And of course, 17th Street, Fort King Road, is going to become more heavily traveled with the new State Road 52. As you exit Dade City to get to the new State Road 52, that's going to be one of the major roads to get there. And so I'm hoping that we're going to be even looking at some improvements to since that's going to be a more heavily used road than it has been in the past, just getting, making that connection now. And that piece is already in the works. It's the piece north of there mm -hmm. that we want to make sure we that's have the connection all the way north. And then with Morningside mm -hmm. being added to that, we want to make sure we have the connection to that as well, which will be the extension of the Withacoochee. So we want to make sure everything kind of, all those dots kind of connect together. Perfect. Thank you. I, I have a Commissioner question. Commissioner Stark. Um, I have two questions. So um, Leonard would not be on this list. It's on a different list. No, because it's on the FDOT work program to be done. Um, I don't know what year it is. It's on our lot as program, so it's already programmed to be constructed. Okay. And um, on the school district situation, um, I understand maybe uh, was did we find out some statutes or issues with the school district and the sidewalks and the <laughs> safety travel and all that? Because I, I just heard something that it actually is statute that they're supposed to transport if there's a safety issue. Yeah, there is a hazardous walks statute, and I can actually kind of give that to you. Um, just remember that has there's several guidelines that go with that hazardous walk situation for them to get that busing. Um, and it's very detailed as far as the statute goes. Um, and they've been looking into that? Yes. Maybe re rethinking yeah. some again, of the... And again, sidewalk is not, unfortunately, a requirement that says it's hazardous, unfortunately. Interesting. It doesn't mean a sidewalk has to be there for it. 
So, and this is federal money, I think, for them. So they do they may have to relook at where they stopped transporting kids, and that's maybe add board, some. And I, we can look at that. That's a school board <coughs> question there. Yeah. Um, and uh, have we looked at the different school properties that don't have any sidewalks in front of them? For example, Seven Springs Elementary does not have any sidewalks. So that's been resolved, and school board actually stepped up to the table, and it, they just poured it, I think, in the last couple of weeks. They're providing a sidewalk along the side and putting in a, actually a bike barn or a bike place. At Seven Springs? Parking. Yep. Okay. At, on the side there, so they don't have to cross in front of the school yeah. while the traffic's coming in. So they actually stepped to the plate and provided the sidewalk on their property because it was the missing sidewalk was on school board property. Yeah. And then what will happen with that, and they added some sidewalk to the south of the property too to connect as well, working with the sidewalk in front of the fire station also. But we'll look at, and this is more school board and the sheriff's office, we'll look at if we need to move the crosswalk now because the kids are going to be crossing at a different location due to that sidewalk being installed. So there's all those components are part of that as well. So Leonard Road, um, the work program is set, and I know this has been a long time coming. Oh, Commissioner Larry was pounding on it. Construction is 2627. <laughs> Oh, so, um, That's how long again, it takes to move up. DOT works on that five year yep. out once you even get on the program as well. But I know that one was just one of many long time coming yeah. as well. And that's one like Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Mariano was saying there. There is no, actually, I do, I think the road is built in the wetland. I think that was done before we got involved. But, <laughs> but there, is, there is no place for someone, and it's on a curve, to escape. The traffic but to fall into the ditch that's very deep into the wetland and so they do fall off the road and jump into the woods that's a big drop so i'm really glad we're, we're getting that one done all right well i mean you do take safe uh safety into account here on this scoring already right uh to commissioner yes Matt. um mariano's point a couple more slides <laughs> it's on here actually i think that was it so I think we actually have. And, and does someone evaluate whether it's better to put a sidewalk or better to go ahead and put something in white that's wider? So what we do is when, for the purpose of scoring and tracking these projects and getting them you know, up to the point where we're designing is, is that we are just using a conceptual. And, and that's why our criteria are based on um, the benefit that the facility would provide and not necessarily exactly what it would be or what it would cost or, or any of those factors. And that is all with the intention of when the project is, uh, you know, greenlit to start moving forward, um, that we would assess that at that time and, you know, make a decision based on the current conditions on the ground and um, really be able to dedicate the, the time and, and the, the resources into um, you know, feasibility study and, and, and actually quantifying impacts and right away acquisition and the, the whole nine yards, if you will. Because it seems to me whenever we can, um, it, it should be as wide as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm wondering, as we looked at our vision roads um, earlier, I think of, you know, my district, I know obviously better than your, your districts, but I know in mine, for example, Trouble Creek Road or Boulevard, or whatever, mm -hmm. Trouble Creek Road. We have preserved right away all the way to U.S., almost to U.S. 19, but um, we're not using it. So how, how many roads do we have that we've had businesses dedicate property to us that we're not using? And another one is River Crossing Boulevard. I know that the um, Timber Greens Golf Club is spending $30,000, $40,000 a year mowing the county property in front of their development because they want it kept to a higher standard than, than our mowing. And I don't know of any plan to ever build two more lanes on River Crossing Boulevard, which ends up turning into Trouble Creek when you cross Little Road. But so how, how around the county, I would love to see an inventory of, of these roads. And if they're we either need to, if we're not going to build, we either need to give the property back to the, the business or maybe consider adding these to some kind of trails network. That's my thought. Yeah. 
from Mr. Waitman. I echo Commissioner Starkey's point. I, I think it's important that we, we need to see the inventory. We need to know what properties are there and what's not being used. I think it on a map, I, that's, that's good information to know and that could potentially save us a lot of time and money uh, down the down the road, if you will, <laughs> uh, <laughs> by knowing this. So thank you, Commissioner Stark. Yeah, I, I know the, the restaurant, at the, it's called Madison's at the corner of Madison and Trouble Creek. Um, when I was talking with the owner, he said when he went to redo that building that he found that he couldn't build as big a building as he wanted because there was a right-of-way preservation that limited his parking, that limited the size of the restaurant that he could have. Um, and I just don't know if we have any plans to widen Trouble Creek. And so, in a way, that's kind of a taking, um, and maybe not, you know, <laughs> what we want to be doing. So. Yeah. Commissioner Mariano, and then we'll try to move on. All right. Um, when I look at the sheet you have up there right now, it says observed pedestrian travel usage as a point score for up to 12 points. I, I just find that very difficult to go along with it. It actually kind of sh tells me why you'd probably see that those three projects I mentioned are so down low, because nobody's going to walk on a dangerous situation. Nobody's going to walk on that old Dixie Highway coming up. Nobody's going to walk on Shady Hills. Even at Hudson High School, when I went to the back street on Hicks Road, uh, the road going across, yep. um, nothing but ditches there. No, so I saw one kid, lines of traffic, but no parent is going to let their kid, if they can help it, walk along that road, especially during that morning. So I don't know why you have 12 know, points to that. Commissioner, remember that project that we denied? Yeah. And I, I denied it because I saw the school bus letting those kids off. I think it was in Seth dis District. Lake what was the name of that road? That was uh, Hill Road. Hill. Hill. Yeah, maybe Hill, no? Yeah, yeah, I'm like, oh, my gosh. We, sure. Yeah, that's just the kids are walking in the road in the dark, no lights. So there may be no observed pedestrian travel usage, but to have that for 12 scoring points, I think is absurd. Uh, I do like the fact that you have I think it should be on there. down here that you have existing roadside ditches or obstructions that cause pedestrians to use vehicle lanes. That's a good one, but you could almost take all those points and stick them in there. I don't know. I, I think that if you're observing a population walking on a, in a dangerous road, that elevates it to me that you need something. Well, and, and that's making the opposite. I, I think you're touching on some of the challenge that we uh, that that we find whenever we score any project is that um, there are certain projects that will score highly on some criteria and others that that may you know not. And um, I, I think I lost my list, but um, you know, not not getting every single point is not. I think the our highest highest score, you know, it's not like we're looking for 100% at the end of the day. Um, and, and Commissioner Mariano, you know, it's a point well made that if it's extremely dangerous, yeah. if there's no possibility, you're not going to have any users. Uh, that's part of why our criteria look to things like filling gaps and yeah. being within the vicinity of schools. In, and so even if today you're not seeing anybody, that is not the one thing. And that's kind of how we got to this strategy of spreading out the the criteria to a lot of things so if you have a project that maybe doesn't score in in one case it has a a place to recover where there's other similar criteria and specifically to the criteria where we talk about hazardous conditions the swales and such we've we've mirrored our assessment of that to the um the safe route that the school board would use for their busing so we don't have a gap where like the county is saying it's it's safe, but the school is not, or vice versa. You know, we're trying to be be consistent with them there, so that um, you know we're not we're not leaving a community that the the school won't send a bus to, but we won't send a sidewalk to. If you understand what I'm saying, right? I mean, and there's a lot of factors, and when we look at these things and we go look at the things, and it's very important, I think, for the for the commissioner, for especially for the district, or that the project that they're familiar with, that they might look at that. You know, to just see it on the list, you, you got to look to what's what's important. I mean, we spend a lot of money on roadways on the central and east side. There's very little on the other side, on the on the west side. So these infill projects for us are critical. They're not much money in the budget, but it's it's big. Mm -hmm. Something else I don't know if it's there. If you want to flip back to it, but 
when you look at ease of right of way, we just talked about the project that may have some issues on certain right of ways, it's tough to get. That dries up the cost. That slows down the acquisition, that slows down the whole project. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at like that old Dixie project, we can get that all that right of way for, for nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's government owned, so we can get it, we get the access, and as far as like maintenance of traffic, there's no need maintenance of traffic. So I don't know how you score that for value, but I know Swiftma, when they look at their projects, they look at what's the best bang for the buck. We should be, somehow that should be in there as well. well and, and that was a, I, a strategic decision as, as well. Um, it, it is without a design, without any kind of feasibility, when we're just looking at it at a tabletop, it, it can be very difficult sometimes to quantify cost, and, and for sure. Old Dixie, the right of way needs, those are very clear to see. Um, but, but, you know, as a, a general practice when we're scoring and, and prioritizing these projects, and, and especially when we're just trying to identify which ones warrant that additional condition, um, we, we did make the decision, at least for, for the time being, we have, we have not considered cost of construction or right-of-way or permitting in our actual ranking and criteria. We, we actually have, have tried to note in our assessment whether or not a right-of-way acquisition phase <coughs> will be required or a permitting phase just for the purposes of, of understanding the project duration and, and the, the phasing that will be required to deliver. Um, but at, at this point, we, we have um, decided not to, uh, and, and really our, our thought process was that we didn't want to not build a project that was a major safety need just because it's a major expense uh, and, and that was why, uh, you know, it, it's, this is the, you, you've hit on exactly the downside of that decision, is that you may have a lot of very easy projects that you don't do um, because they maybe don't score as high, even though they are easy, but the alternative would be you maybe have a hard project that would score very well that you wouldn't do just because it was hard. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a challenging balance um, uh, for sure. Well, and again, these are, these are charts, these are recommendations based upon data that so you've got to collect. When, when I consider way back when, right. Commissioner Starkey, I think you remember this very well, we had a couple of uh, Mitchell High students, I believe it was, uh, skipping school, went to cross a road, there was no sidewalk, they got killed. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened up at Hicks Road. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think with, it's in Lake Boulevard. Well, another one, but I want to stick to these two because their timeline is very critical in, in getting it done. When we said we were going to do both roads, um, Hicks Road had a lot of different properties all the way up and down through it, right? It was tough. Uh, we actually had meetings at the high school to try to get people to give us the right of way to, to make the donations or, you know, based upon not going through the eminent domain process. You went door to door, didn't you, sir? I went door to door and we got everybody in a room and we, we, we sped up the process. We saved a lot of money by doing it that way as well. On the flip side, down at Seven Springs, we had all the right of way. That project was done in like a year or two. This other one still took six, seven years to get it done. So again, if someone's going to be looking at this and we're going to make a decision of what needs to be done, part of the value is getting it done quicker and cheaper to get a better value for our citizens. And that may mean a harder project is going to take longer to get and maybe it doesn't get the priority because it's going to take longer, et cetera. That may be a trigger, like we did at Hicks Road, to get people to come to the table and say, you know what, we want this so bad we're going to go work with you to get that project done. And I thought that would be a good template for future projects. I haven't seen it used again lately, but it's, it's, a, it's a good approach that, you know, if, if Dade City needs a sidewalk done and we know we get right away issues, we can say, look, we're not going to get up in the property until we know we're going to get cooperation the right, right away, mm -hmm. like we did up at Hicks Road. Commissioner Wagner. Thank you. This goes back to Commissioner Starkey's point. I have a couple of things. It goes back to Commissioner Starkey's point of understanding the inventory of right-of-way that we, we have. You know, if, if there's a project that's lower down on the list, but all of a sudden we realize we have inventory there that's already purchased, mm -hmm. that should theoretically, you're saving money, it's on the list, I would think bump it up because, you know, that it's kind of in the middle of that easy to hard gap that you're trying to fill. So... Um, I think that's something really to consider and look at. Next, I didn't really hear if you're comparing when you come to your, your sidewalks and the needs of sidewalks. 
if you're looking at the school's need, for example, in the legislative session, we're trying to get funding for sidewalks at Denham Oaks and uh, Pineview Elementary because of the two mile bus station. I mean, you go through Lake Pageant, I mean, walking, I mean, everybody campaigns through Lake Pageant, right? I mean, <laughs> whew, you, <laughs> you can get spin up, turn around, lost in there, and but there's, it's not necessarily safe to walk and those kids are walking. So we're fighting for sidewalk funding for that school. And then Denham Oaks, when you look at the services that Denham Oaks provide for hearing impaired and they have other programs for, for kids with, with special needs, that cool school kind of specializes in, in helping folks with physical disabilities. And to get them to school safely with, with whatever their disability, they can't hear, see what, whatever it may be, I don't know, I feel like if, if you look at the project and what, what's, what's the services be provi being provided in that project area, if you know the detail behind a denim oaks or you kind of know the bigger picture of the kids walking to elementary school in the Lake Pageant area, I don't know, I, I think each all of us have examples like that in our district and I don't necessarily think this scoring pattern doesn't go far enough to recognize what some of these facilities and these these places are that serve the needs of our, of our folks that, that live in that area. Well, I should say the school um, board, I mean, is very helpful <coughs> in identifying those projects and, and putting them on the list initially. And one of our biggest changes, um, this, this is a, a ranking criteria that's been around for a number of years, but when we refreshed it most recently, one of our biggest changes was to uh, specifically look at whether or not it was in, within that two mile radius of uh, the Pasco County schools to, to uh, bump those scores up, um, you know, for, for those pr prospective uh, students traveling. Uh, so, you know, definitely we are, we are getting a lot of feedback and um, the MPO, uh, Tina, you're, uh, you have a committee with the schools and they're, they're providing a lot of feedback to us uh, to bring those schools in. And we are, um, you know, trying to, to as much as we can you know, capture those because uh, I mean, in in a way that you you've correctly identified one of my shortcomings, right? I, I can't live in all these neighborhoods, so I'm dependent on people to bring the needs, um, and and we do appreciate you know yourself, your staff, the school board, and the people who who've brought the needs to us uh, so that we can start to address them. Speaking about that, what about Cypress Elementary? And you know, we heard a lot from uh, uh, people when we were putting the apart when the apartments came in on Ridge Road, I'm trying to remember that in Tanglewood. What's the name of that road? Tanglewood Drive. Tanglewood. Tanglewood Drive. Yeah. I don't know if that's on here and those there's no sidewalk and no. those kids are walking to school and the cars are queuing. So I don't know if you've looked at that one, but I, I do want to make sure we I think that's in Social Bradford. I think that's in your district, but you may want to keep an eye on that one and make sure we're looking at Tanglewood. Sam, do you have more to your presentation? Uh, no, I appreciate y'all's time. Thank Certainly. you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item, uh, this is performance safety measures. This is the follow-up presentation. And I believe we're going to be hearing from um, Tina and Johnny on this one, Ms. Russo and Mr. Coors. Thank you, Tina Russo, Pasco MPO, MPO staff, and Johnny Coors. Um, this is the follow-up to last month's performance safety measures where we presented to you that snapshot that we have to present to you and you actually vote on what our performance measures are going to be for the com coming year and we, we asked for 10% reductions. So one of the things that came out of that meeting or that, that voting was some significant questions about some of our fatalities and the data that how we get them. So this is kind of that follow up to last month's presentation that we did. I'll let you be the remote guy. <laughs> so the, the main questions that came out of that, that meeting was, and we're going to talk about these, was how we get VMT. That's going to be a fun conversation. Um, but Something that helps along those lines that kept me and asked and Commissioner Starkey asked these was 
What are our fatalities based to per capita, which is a little easier number for us to look at, is our population growth, which is one of the biggest conversations we always have when we talk about serious injuries and fatalities on our roadways. And that's based on how many people are moving in here as well. So those, we're going to look at those. We're going to also look at fatalities based on our road system. That was one of the conversations. Are they on our state roads? Are they on our local roads? Combination of both. So we're going to look at that briefly as well. And then who are the folks being killed on our roadways? Who are the users? And we're going to look at that as well. We're also going to look at those crash types because we think that's really, really important for us to know what is happening so we can help prevent them. So we're going to look at those crash types and those locations. Again, we've always talked about there is no magic spot, unfortunately, when it comes to these crashes. And again, I'm going to call them crashes. They're not accidents. So the first thing is, where do we get this data? It comes from a long-form crash report done by law enforcement. So everything is based on what we get out of this crash report. We use something called Signal 4. We use something called crash management data that uses these reports to get the data or get the um, stats that we're looking at. So we're at the mercy of this report. This has come a long way as far as that goes, but we're at the mercy of that report. So <laughs> you had to come to it, didn't you? So vehicle miles is one of the biggest things that when we used that snapshot last month was our fatalities are based on those vehicle miles, which is vehicle miles travel. That kind of gives us a hint how much people are driving. So it gives us vehicle miles. We also use a five-year trend. I think it's really important to realize that we don't base it on last year. One is the data is not completely up to date, even by now for last year's fatalities. But the most important thing is that five year gives us a trend and not one anomaly of a year. Vehicle miles, this is the formula, and then if Johnny wants to try to explain it. So vehicle miles, we're always asked how vehicle miles are calculated. Well, there it is. <laughs> so um, DOT is not willing always to have this discussion, but vehicle miles, and Johnny can add to it, is basically based on travel data, is, is our count, basically. So. And then Johnny looked up some a little bit more information on that, and he can provide that. Well, just briefly, this was a question that uh, Councilman Smith had, just exactly how VMT was calculated. And I think from this, we can get an idea that this is an estimate. It's extremely difficult, I would imagine, to, to accurately calculate. Um, so the formula um, is an estimate, and that's, <laughs> that's all. Again, it's by travel counts on segments of roadway is basically what you can tell like that. We do use traffic counts quite a bit for several different reasons, but we're going to look at the next data, which was really important, that was asked by Commissioner Starkey that gives us a little bit of a better idea based on our population growth as well. So these are the numbers. Kind of instead of using vehicle miles traveled, we use that per capita. So to the left there is the Florida population. To the right there is Pasco's population. And that first set is 2010, based on 2010 um, census. Now you have to remember, the bottom one's 2020. We're already in 23, and that number's already gone up quite a bit. But these are the numbers we have. We still are past that average, state average. And we actually looked at Hillsborough and Pinellas again. So we're a little bit above that average for um, per capita as well. So again, we were at 464,000 or so in 2010. In 2020, again, this number's changed already. We're at 561,000, and of course, we're higher than that. But again, our number is too high even when it comes yeah. to per capita, and we're above the state average when it comes to per capita as well. But this data, knowing this, should help us get federal grants. Yeah, again, it's a little bit more understandable than, than that Tells BMT. A story. Tells yes. a story. Yes. Yeah. And then next. So the next one was, where are these crashes occurring? Are they cra occurring on state roads? Or are they occurring on local roads? So if you can read that small part at the bottom, most of them are occurring on our state roads, some of them local. But again, look at that picture. Those yellow dots are serious injury crashes. Those red dots are fatalities. You can kind of see, you know, 19, 
Little Road's a county road, but 75, 301, 98, you can kind of see those major areas of crashes on the state roads. Again, some of our local roads. Little is becoming very similar to 19, unfortunately. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mariano and then Commissioner Bradford. On the map, can you blow that up or take a guess where you think Shady Hills Road is on that? So where the Hillsboro line is? No, Shady Hills. Oh, Shady Hills. So Shady Hills, you can see Ridge, right Ridge smack in the middle there, I think, is actually Suncoast towards the west. Yeah. And that's I probably looked, 41. So. Sam and I actually looked and <coughs> took a quick look at Shady Hills. We can bring those stats to you directly about Shady Hills as well. It's okay. really hard to read Shady Hills because Suncoast is right beside you. Yeah. <laughs> so right, is, is we'll this, bring you. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is this on TV? Because I have to go to a doctor's appointment, but I want to listen to you. Yes, so it is being strained. I'm trying to find it here. Okay, so I'll, I'll look for it while you're talking. I'll Thank you. you. Oh, great. Oh, that's great. Sorry, I have to go to eye doctor. Okay. So again, state roads, the question was, most, a lot of them are on our state roads, but still we do have some on our local roads as well. Um, and I'm going to dive down a little deeper as we move forward with this as well. Again, when we look at a map for Pasco County, it's really hard. I can do it in sections where you can see a little bit, drill them down a little bit. And we can start doing this even more each meeting, kind of drill down specific corridors and look at them as well. We did that with 19. That was the next question, and, and it's really hard because we use that crash form, long form data. We have to look at each one. But this was from the 19 study that we did last year. The, the question was about impairment and testing and all those things. So we found out that 39% of those crashes are not tested, pending, or unknown. So that's 39% that we don't know what happened and when it comes to impairment. We do know, now this is 19 and this is bike pet only. We do know that 51% on 19 of those fatalities did test positive for drug and alcohol. So that's 51% we know. We have an unknown of 39%. So if we do 51% of that 39, we're probably looking at 65, 75%. And I was just doing the easy math in my head. But again, those, those reports, that data comes off of those long forms. And if you look at them, they're not tested quite often, OK? Well, uh, I'll give okay. some flexibility to that, Mr. Trapp, sorry. Uh, I think Mr. Bradford, Mr. Brad let, me, let me let Gary go next. and then. I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's important also to, to turn, and you all know this, is we've got five law enforcement agencies in this county. Five. Dade City, except for Hills on that side, Port Ritchie, New Port Ritchie, and then the Sheriff's Office. Uh, do they all get the same training filling out these forms? Yes. Would I absolutely 100% trust these forms? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I get a kick out of uh, the, uh, the professionalism that you use. And the bottom line is um, most of those, a, a lot of those crashes, when you said they're, they're, not, uh, they're not issuing citations, because we don't know what happened. There's not witnesses. There's not physical evidence. They show up. They do the report. Generally, it's for insurance purposes a lot of times. And it's, thank you very much, on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So to take all of this information and try to boil it down into uh, what y'all are trying to do for this county is very, very difficult. And, and I think everybody should understand that. It's, it's not an easy task. So, and you have to look at it sometimes with a jaundice eye. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Mariano. And, and, and in fairness to our deputies out there, troopers that are out there, if they interview the people, which they do, before the, as they're filling out the report, if they don't think there's anybody on drugs, why go through that? There's not, not going to be a need for a test. Absolutely. I think all the ones that are done here, that 61% is something that 
something was sensed and they went after it. Yeah, you've so I think it's, it's I think I think we can go by that 39% saying officers didn't see any need for it and moved on. So you shouldn't count it as or even consider it that that was a that was a thing. Now I would say it got tested, not pending. What does that mean? Not pending. So tested, um, not tested, pending, unknown. So the so pending. Pending so the is again sometimes six months plus right. for for drug alcohol to come back. So um, the unknown control. is just not the unknown is just not commented on. Right. So maybe what we should do is actually take that thirty nine percent and separate out that pending, and just kind of leave that out, and okay. we can look at that for for later on down the road. We'll we'll okay. break that out. I think if you break that out now, it just because that number could go up to a, a significant number. It may be a very small number. We don't know. But I think the pending part, if you break that out, the other tested and unknown, I think it can stay okay. in the same category. Understood. So, question? Commissioner so Brown. that that's, they draw blood? Correct. They draw blood. They set it off. They're waiting for a response. The LE has to. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's, I want to make sure we're on the same sheet of music. And when it comes to these um, in Pasco County, um, Long form crash reports only come from FHP and those other jurisdictions. Our sheriff office does not do long form crash reports. So again, that that's the agency that wants that does crashes in Pasco County. And that differs from county to county as well. So you know that again, so again, Newport Richie's Upper Hills do some of those. Um, sheriff's office does help with those non long forms as well. But the only one that doesn't countywide again is FHP, and that's been the issue as they go from crash to crash to right. crash. That's right. Next, please. So could, could you stay one, one more second? Commissioner Murray. Uh, thank you. I know it's we're running a little bit late here, but Sorry. this is such an important thing. With all the safety money that NACO talked about not going out there, uh, with 19 being so dangerous, with this data that's right here, uh, the reason I was late for a couple of minutes, we had a meeting with probably 20 people in the conference room all talking about homeless issues. The drugs came out quite a bit. The opioid task force came out quite a bit. So I think this data here put in with your grant might even enable to package with another part of some other opioid funding, drug money, that might be something you could put to to help fund the, uh, extra safety as well. And I know Carl and I have talked while I was up at NACO. I would text Carl every time I saw something that was transportation related that we should be looking at. So I don't know if you get the list. So real quick, you asked what the crash types were, and we've talked about this <coughs> quite a bit, and this is what's really important, because this is one of those um, components, those behaviors that we're going to really actually focus on to lower those numbers in this coming year. And that top one is lane departures, and if we look at the next slide, so we know lane departures, if you see at the very top, it's our biggest one. We had that 40, is it 45 mm -hmm. fatalities up there? So that's one of our biggest ones. Now, lane departures can be a lots of types of, of crashes. Unfortunately, half of that number is someone driving off the road with no seatbelt on, hitting a fixed object. So that means they're ejected, and that's why it's probably a fatality as well. Mm -hmm. So those are some education. There might be, again, enforcement comes in there. We're doing road safety audits. I mentioned this last month especially for Bellamy Brothers, where this is a huge issue with lane departure, and that's where those safety edges and other things. But that's the big one there. Next. So this is the one. These are the locations of those lane departures. I'm sorry it's so little. But we do have a good area, and actually Bellamy Brothers is on this map. It's right smack in the center of the county, a little bit north. That blue dot, that blue dot means there's been more than one crash. So we'll look at these areas for lane departures and kind of go from there. Hmm. It's one of many behaviors that we're looking at that we're trying to do something with. I'm actually meeting with DOT, FHP next Wednesday. We're going to do some two-hour observations at Bellamy Brothers and see what we can do as well. Commissioner Wayman has a question. Right. Thank you, Chair. So go back one, go back one slide, please. So we're getting this county, you know, lots of roundabouts. Are y'all tracking data on roundabout accidents? I, I would hope there wouldn't be any fatalities but with pedestrians, but be interested to see as the more roundabouts come online, what that data shows, increase, decreases, that, you know. 
And I know the national data definitely shows that, you know, you might have even more crashes at roundabouts, but they're a lot less serious because mm -hmm. they're lower speeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's why you want roundabouts around, because again, your crashes are much lower speed. So usually we don't have any fatalities. I can look at our roundabouts. I know as a cyclist, I love roundabouts instead of an intersection riding through them. Because I know, you know, we can you know, all yield to each other. I take the lane, and it's much easier than someone making a right turn on me. In fact, I'd rather ride in the bike lane for that reason in a roundabout than I do on the multi-use path because I'm part of the traffic. But I can get you the national information, and I can provide some local information as well. We do know that there are less fatalities and serious injuries mm -hmm. with roundabouts because they're lower speeds. Yeah, I just, particularly in, you know, our municipalities are smaller yeah. in nature, right? Yeah. And uh, but a lot of traffic bottlenecks into our county's municipalities. And so I just, to keep flow going as more folks move in, and then I think it'd be important to track our local, you know, roundabout okay. data. Hopefully there is none, but it's a new, it's a new traffic pattern that we're seeing here. So I think we need to add it to the list. Okay. So, and then again, unfortunately, our no seatbelt's a big one. <coughs> Impaired driving is a, a big one. Our aging drivers is a huge one for Pasco County as well. And there's some educational programs, like I said, that we're going to start taking advantage of that will help too. Because again, it's the five E's, you guys. It's not just one leg in that stool. We have to have the engineering. We have to have the education. We have to have the enforcement. We have to have that engagement to do the education as well. And then we talk about environment. So they all work together. But there's our seatbelt fatalities as well. It's just a, a scary trend to think that people are not using their seatbelts again. Because if people wore helmets and seatbelts, our fatality rate would probably <laughs> drop 50%, is kind of what the Federal Highway has been telling us for years. So I think the biggest important part of this is we need to focus on moving people and not vehicles. And you're going to hear me say that over and over again. That's Fowler Avenue in Hillsborough. Fowler Avenue has some great mid-blocks on it now, Fowler, Fletcher, Bush, and Hillsborough. We're going to be doing those on 19 as well. But you're going to see this from here on out because this is what's going to make the difference of us lowering those numbers, us working together with the speed on our roadways, um, and then all these things working together. This was just, again, a follow-up on our performance measures and how we're going to lower them, just providing a little bit more detail. And we always appreciate the conversation because this is our number one goal is, is saving lives. Thank you, Ms. Russo. Any questions for Tina or for Johnny on this? Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Under other business, meetings held, scheduled, items of note. Um, I'll just, I'll start out just saying how great it is to see State Road 52 semi-open. Uh, I did learn something about why when you're going 55 or, or 60 miles per hour on a two-lane road and you come to a four-lane section, it goes down to 45 because of the curbing. And I thought that was rather interesting. I've always wondered why. You know, sometimes I wonder if we're helping ourselves out by going to four lane if it's only 45 versus 55 in a two lane, but then you've got the 45 mile per hour person in the 55 lane. But that was interesting. But it is a beautiful stretch. I'm just amazed how quickly uh, one can get from Dade City to the interstate now. All my life having wound through St. Leo and San Antonio and around, and I always felt like getting to the airport, half the trip was getting to the interstate. Uh, so it, it's for the time being, it, and when the is fully open. I think it's really going to be great. And so just, uh, and I know I've always thought the county commissioners, you know, you all are the ones making that trip more often. Why hasn't that road been widened sooner? Uh, you all have been the one punishing yourselves, but it's great that it's finally, <laughs> finally open. And so I get to talk only every once in a while, right, yeah. Gary? Yeah. Uh, but, um, but it was great to see that section open and especially to see it happening at this time in Dade City before, as the growth is coming and before the growth is coming instead of after. Uh, so that's important as well. So, um, but thanks for, um, and to DOT for getting that through and, and everything, everyone that was involved. 
Anyone else have any comments to make at this point for the record, for the good of the order? Okay. Anything further from staff? No, thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no other business to be transacted today, I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.